স্যার এখন দিয়ে স্যার 10 সেকেন্ড পরে স্যার কথা বলা শুরু করুন 10 সেকেন্ড পরে স্যার তো শেয়ার করব এখন So good afternoon. I welcome you all to our today's webinar, 20th of July. So this webinar is supported by AO Alliance. You know that AO Alliance is an organization, voluntary organization, who works for low-income countries and middle-income countries all over the world, mostly in Asia and Africa, and they are dedicated to improve fracture care in these regions. At the same time, they try to help local capacity build up. So today, our speaker, sir, Dr. Kaji Shoydul Alam, is an assistant professor from Dhaka Medical College. His specialty is pediatric orthopedics. We have Dr. Dhabal Desai. He is also from India. He is the immediate past president from Gujarat Orthopedic Association, and he is also a senior EO faculty, a trainer and EO trauma faculty as well. His specialty is in pelvic vestibular trauma and orthogeriatric care. And we have another gentleman from India, Chennai, Dr. Chidambaram. He is also consultant orthopedics. He works mostly on shoulder and upper limb. He is also, uh, uh, I mean, he has an association called CC that he works for shoulder and elbow arth arthroplasty and arthroscopy. So he's a patient for that. So these three are our speakers. And today's topic, first topic, will be on proximal humeral fracture. Will be spoken by Dr. Kaji Shoydul Alam. We will speak for 15 minutes, followed by you have a question and answer for 15 minutes. After that, Dr. R. Chidambaram will talk on advances in proximal humerus fractures. We will speak for 15 minutes. After his talk, we have question and answer for 15 minutes. After that, we have a special case discussion on proximal humeral fracture by Dr. Dhabal Desai from India. He will speak for 20 minutes. And at the end, there is a talk, four-part proximal humeral fracture, which is primarily without treating, uh, without fixing, go for reverse shoulder arthroplasty as a primary treatment. Dr. Chidambara will talk on that for 15 minutes. After that, we'll have question and answer 15 minutes. And if at the end there is some time, I can show you one case for discussion only. So these are panel of experts, Professor Amjad Hussain, he's a very senior teacher for all of us. He's also the chair of the, our country chair for the AO um, Alliance, Bangladesh. And you know Dr. Ram Chidamara and Dr. the chair from India. They are supporting us today. So the whole show will be coordinated by Dr. Uh, uh, moderated by Dr. Shantanudhar Iman from Silet. So kindly put your question and answers to your Q&A box so that we can answer them in the chat box. You can have other chit chats. So we'll try so that you make all the questions in the Q&A box. Can we have a great webinar? Thank you. I request Dr. Iman to take over. Thank you, sir. Dr. Vicky Bria, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome all participants in today's webinar on 29th July. This is the fourth webinar of this month. And today's topic is uh, proximal humerus fracture. Uh, by this time, you all of you know uh, to our, about the today's uh, talk, uh, about today's topics of lecture and who are the experts here. Uh, I also welcoming all the panel of experts, including Professor Amjad Hussain, sir, who is the uh, member of uh, Steering Committee of Alliance Asia, and he's the coordinator of uh, non-operative fracture treatment, uh, AO Alliance Asia. Uh, 
Dr. Dhabul, Dhabul Deshai, who is a very much senior EO faculty, and he's from India. And uh, Dr. Ram Chidambaram is a very eminent shoulder, elbow uh, surgeon, upper extremity surgeon. He is doing his practices in shoulder and elbow for the last 20 years. I welcome all of you, sir, for this uh, and today's webinar. Uh, now, I would like to request Dr. Kaji Shoidul Lalo, who is assistant professor at Dhaka Medical College, to start today's session by his talk on proximal humerus fracture. Uh, Dr. Kaji Shoidul Lalo, please start sharing your screen. By this time, I request to all the participants to put the question or any query in question and answer box uh, to all uh, to the, our panel of experts. We will discuss it after uh, ending of each lecture. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Kadish Shwedul Alam. Assistant Professor from Dhaka Medical College Hospital. And today I'm going to talk about on proximal humerus fracture. So we are going to talk about the anatomy, especially the clinical importance one, the among the classifications, the imaging techniques, decision-making tips and tricks, and the various treatment options for the proximal humerus fractures. The proximal humerus fractures accounts up to 45% of all humerus fracture, but it can rise up, up to 75% if the patient is elderly. In young patient, it occurs due to high energy trauma usually, but in older patient, it mostly occurs due to osteoporosis. Now anatomy. We all know in the proximal humerus, there are actually four parts, head, greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, and surgical neck. There is another entity called anatomical neck, which actually define, demarcates the head from the rest of the femur. Regarding blood supply, it is, the proximal humerus is supplied by the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral artery, which is a branch of the axillary artery. And if you look at the pictures, you can see both the branches actually circumference the surgical neck of the humerus. So any fracture in the proximal humerus can jeopardize the blood supply. So it is very much important to remember this uh, circulation pattern, which is also known as the tethered trifurcation. And the import, one of the very important nerve, that is the axillary nerve that supplies the deltoid muscles. The shoulder, the upper arm actually hangs from the shoulder joint. It is supported by a lot of soft, soft tissue structures. Among them, the rotator cuff is one of the very most important one. And it actually holds the upper end of the humerus like a hand. If you remember this by this picture, so this represents actually the subscapularis, then the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the teres minor. Or among the, all the fragments, both the tuberosity and the surgical neck are under the influence of specific muscles. As for example, the greater tuberosity, if it is fractured, it is actually pulled away posterior medially by the action of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. While the lesser tuberosity is under the control of subscapularis and the surgical neck that is under the control of pectoralis major. So we have to consider the action of these muscles if this fracture occurred at their specific sites. In the classification, there are actually mainly two important classifications. One is near four part classifications and another one is AO classification. But remember, all, among all the classification, to determine the fracture type is actually very difficult. In near classification, it is based upon three ossification center. The fusion of this ossification center at the physis creates a weakened area that actually leads to the fractures whenever the patient has sustained any trauma. The greater tuberosity fracture is usually associated with anterior dislocation and the lesser tuberosity are usually associated with posterior dislocation. In near classification, there are actually four types, type one, two, three, and four. In type one, it is one part or undisplaced fractures. Interesting thing to be noted are that there may be a, uh, multiple fracture lines, but the fracture fragments are displaced less than one centimeter or angulation is less than 45 degree among each other if, if that's if such so, then it is still counted as undisplaced fracture or one part fracture. In second part, it is two part fractures. The fracture line occurs either through the anatomical neck or surgical neck or greater tuberosity or lesser tuberosity. But here the fracture fragments are displaced more than one centimeter or angulation will be more than 45 degree. In three part fracture, remember the surgical neck fracture is masked. It, it will be associated with either greater tuberosity or lesser tuberosity fractures. In four-part fractures, 
all the surgical neck along with the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity all will be fractured together and any fracture pattern can be associated with shoulder dislocation. In 2002, Nier added two another subtypes into his classifications. One is the vulgus impacted four part fracture. The importance of this vulgus impacted four part fracture is the head, it is actually displaced like the proximal end of the distal fragment is displaced medially, which actually jeopardizes the vascular supply. So, this is another very much important point. So, he included as a separate entity. Involving the articular surface is the last one he added and its incidence is actually very low, only 0.7%. The proximal humerus is highly associated with chances of avascular necrosis. And we can determine how the chances are by this Hartel criteria. In this picture, it is said that if the metaphyseal extension of the humeral head is less than 9 mm, in some texts it is written as less than 8 mm also, medial hinge disruption more than 2 mm, or fracture through the anatomical neck, any one of them if are present, will lead to avascular necrosis. But if there is a combination, then the chances of avascular necrosis may rise up to 95%. So let us see how it, they actually measured it. If the head is fractured, but a metaphyseal portion is attached with the head, and that metaphyseal portion is quite large, more than nine millimeter. If it is such, so it, you can clearly see in the X-ray, it is said that that the circulation hampered will be minimum. So chances of ABN is less. That's why the criteria say that if the metaphyseal extension of the head is less than nine millimeter, the chances of ABN is high. So you can see in the X-ray, this is the head, and this is the metaphyseal extension, which is definitely larger than nine millimeter. So this head is likely viable. Second one is the displacement of the proximal end of the distal fragment by two millimeter, which is known as by the medial hinge. If the head is impacted and there is no medial hinge is protruded, then it is actually safe from APN. But if the head is displaced laterally and the medial hinge is displaced from the head by at least more than two millimeter, then there is increased chance of avascular necrosis. So you can, if you see, look at this x-ray, the head is clearly displaced laterally and the hinge is there, which is more than two millimeter. And again, it will hamper that tethered trifurcation of the axillary branches and it will lead to chance, increased chances of ABN. So this head is likely not viable. In AO classification, it is actually have got very many subtypes. I am not going to mention all of them. You can go through the websites for the details of it. But the main important theme is it is divided into three parts, A, B, and C. Type A is the extra articular unifocal, that is two part. It can be either greater tuberosity or through the surgical neck. Type B is the extra articular but bifocal, so it is actually the three part. And type C is the intra articular fracture, and usually these are associated with four part fractures. The one of the few important information in the AO classifications are there are coronal deformity fractures, and there is a location of combination failure. If you see in the X rays, you, you can see at the medial end, if, they, if the combination is there, then it will lead into a varus deformity. And if the combination is there, it will lead into valgus deformity. But relatively, the varus is the safer one because the, in the valgus position, the medial hinge will be protruded towards medially and it will increase the chances of AP. There are different imaging techniques. Among them, the most important was the X-ray, which is also known as near Thomas Luris. We can also go for CT scan, MRI, angiography, ultrasonography, dual X -ray, a dual energy X-ray absorptiometry also. In imaging techniques, if you consider the near trauma series, it is divided into three parts. One is AP or Gracia view. The importance is it is not like a typical AP view where the X-ray beam is directed perpendicular to the coronal plane of the body. It is actually directed perpendicular to the plane of the scapula. So this is how it, is, it has to be taken in the near AP or Gracia view and it will clearly demarcate if there is any medial or lateral displacement in the proximal, femur, the proximal humerus. In lateral view, it will, the extra beam will be directed through the same plane of the scapula. So this is how it has been taken. It is also known as lateral Y view of the shoulder because this is how it looks. In this lateral view, the scapula will look the, or will have the appearance of the English letter Y. So it is also known as lateral Y view. It is very much important to distinguish any coronal plane fracture with anterior and posterior displacement. In axillary view, 
the arm is abducted and the exabeam is directed through the axillary pitch. It has got a modification also. It has also known as the Bellevue axillary view. And it, this is how it has, has to be taken. But the most important thing is both the axillary view and the Bellevue view will demarcate the relationship of the uh, humoral head along with the glenoid. So these are the main three views of near trauma classifications. There is another important view, which is also known as bumped up view in the traumatic axillary view where the arm you cannot abduct. It is held in a shoulder arm and a ring immobilizer. And this is how it has to be taken, which will give you the axillary view. So how you decide when and how to treat this proximal humerus. Remember, 80% of the proximal humerus fractures are non-displaced and can be successfully treated non-operatively. Around 20% are displaced. So whether you go for operative or non-operative, it depends upon multiple factors. It depends upon the fracture pattern, where the fracture pattern is, whether it is associated in, uh, along with the greater tuberosity only, or in the surgical net, or in the anatomical net, it will all count in. How is the head viability um, by the Hartel uh, avian criteria? The patient age and the comorbidities, the bone quality, implant limitations, we need to all consider them together to decide whether we go for operative treatment or non-operative treatment. So if we want to consider treatment option first, we need to consider these factors. The patient factors, functional needs, how much he actually requires. In elderly people, we do not go for any improved function. The pain really is the main one. So we definitely choose non-operative treatment for the elderly patient. And if the patient has a lot of comorbidities, if, it, if the operation is very much risky, then we can go for the non-operative treatment also. The surgeon factors, fracture personality like the displacement, deforming forces, fragment stability, bone quality, they will all come into, into uh, action whenever you're taking decision about the proximal tumor, humerus tract. If you want to guess an idea how the bone quality actually is, this is a very rough idea. So you can put four markers on the humerus, A, B, C, and D. In one important thing is the line AB should be aperted by two centimeters at least from the line CD and measure the particle thickness in at this four point. Sum up them up and divide it by the four. And if the, your result is less than four millimeter, it gives highly indicative of low bone mineral density. In a nutshell, if you want to make a decision, look at the patient age. If he is less than 30 to 50 years of age, that means the bone should be in good quality. So we will preserve the function and that will be our main primary objective. And for that, we will go for anatomical reduction and soft or soft tissue sparing stable fixation. Hemiatroplasty is reserved for non-reconstructable fractures only. But if the patient is elderly, that means the bone quality is poor, so pain relief will be your primary, our primary objective. Non-operative treatment, if the fracture is stable and early motion is possible, we can choose. But if the fracture is unstable, we can go for open reduction and internal fixation if the head is viable and the fracture is reducible. But hemiatroplasty will again should be considered if the head is not viable or the fracture is not repairable. In non-operative options, we can go for universal shoulder immobilizer. The early range of motion should be started as soon as the pain permits. Near one clock part uh, fractures, elderly patients are our main candidates for non-operative options. But in the displaced fracture, like two, two up to four part, high comorbidity or low demand patients, low compliance patients, poor bone quality, if they are included, then for these displaced fractures, we can choose the non-operative treatment options also. The advantage, if you want to take from non-operative treatment, we have to start early exercises. The shoulder should not be immobilized for more, more than two to three weeks because by that time, the pain should be, should be minimized to allow movement. Pendulum exercise after two weeks should be started, but avoid the external rotation in the first after two weeks initially. Active assisted motion forward or the side arm elevation can be started after two to three weeks of the pendulum exercise. And lastly, the head fully exercise can be started. The full realm of Shoulder joint is, is to be expected by within one year. If you want to go for operative treatment, there are a lot of options among them, this percutaneous caver fixation, open reduction and internal fixation by DCP or locking plate or fillows, intramedullary nail or replacement we can consider. Open fracture, associated any dislocations, displaced fracture and the patient is young or active, four part bulbous impacted fractures are the main candidate for operative indications. But in elderly, the indication for surgery are relative. 
doesn't matter which better uh, which strategy you we use for the operative treatment whenever you go for open reduction and internal fixation strategy or even for a uh, close reduction and internal fixation strategy remember to achieve these goals reduce shoulder dislocation if present reduce the fragments well maintain the neck shape relationship which is about uh, roughly 130 degree calcar contact if possible reduce or secure the tuberosity even if you need to suture them up oppose the diffusing forces and support the comminuted sections, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, and always fix to the good bone. If you want to go for caver fixation, this is how you should do it. The caver should be directed from up to downwards if you are fixing the greater tuberosities, and it should be directed, directed from down to upwards if you are dealing with surgical neck fractures. Now, whenever you want to put the caver for the greater tuberosity, first hold the greater tuberosity and then enter into the medial cortex, but make sure that your exit point at the medial cortex should lie at least two centimeter from the medial end of the head. And after, for the surgical neck fixation, the entry point of the caver on the lateral cortex should be at least twice x the di di distance between the upper end and the lower end of the humerus. Suppose if the upper end and lower end is two centimeter, then at least four centimeter away you should start and the angle is usually roughly 45 degrees. We can go for open reduction internal fixation by plates also. Among them, the phyllos is the most uh, widely used uh, nowadays. But the important information is, applying the phyllos plate only is not going, may not give you the uh, good result. The rotator cuff has to be sutured with the phyllos plate to get the final outcome. If we have a combination in a specific position that may lead into varus or valgus position, then you need to be very much cautious to reduce them. Because as I've already told you, the valgus, which has got the uh, medial uh, displacement of the medial hinge, increase the chances of ABN, so it has to be reduced. So in this example, you can see the head is clearly displaced laterally and the proximal end is displaced medially, producing the medial hinge. So whenever you apply the phyllos plate, make sure you use a non-locking screw to pull, the, pull that the distal fragment towards the plate may, and the, thereby reducing or neutralizing the valgus forces. In case of varus deformities, make sure you use locked screw and this inframedial screw has to be there that will, will hold your varus deformities. If the tuberosity are fractures, they need to be reduced, even if it may, it may require open reduction. And the indication for open reduction for the tuberosities are if the patient is young, five millimeter displacement are the indicated, but if the patient is old, up to 10 millimeter, you can consider. And you need to fix them up by, to oppose the tension forces by sutures, by, as either by bone to bone or between the rotator intervals. You can apply screws also to fix the tuberosities. We can always go for intermedullary nailing. That is also another option. And like the last uh, the replacement hemiarthroplasty, we can always consider if the fracture is non-reducible, non-reconstructable, or if the head is non-viable. Among the surgical approaches, delta pectoral and deltoid split are the main important one that we always use. The delta pectoral allow extensile exposure to the proximal humerus, and our open reduction and internal fixation or arthroplasty can be achieved through this way. The deltoid split is actually very much easier for plate placement in gluteal tuberosity fractures and require very few assistance. Just remember, if you go for delta pectoral approach, be aware of the devascularization, that means vascular injury chances are high. And if you go for delta split approach, then be aware of the axillary nerve because it can be injured. These are the complications that we encounter during the trauma time or even during that management or treatment part of the proximal humerus fractures. The neurovascular injury could be there, chest injury, avascular necrosis, myositis ossification, stiffness, malunion, nonunion, all could be there during the treatment part or any part of the treatment of proximal humerus fractures. So my take home message is, proximal humerus fracture is very common in elderly patients. Understanding the mechanism of displacement of fracture fragments will help in the formulation of the treatment line. Always take into account the chances of ABN and the bone quality and decide accordingly. And always remember the patient age also. Young patients, operative, elderly patients, non-operative is the treatment of choice if properly indicated. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kajik Shoigulalo, for your nice presentation. Uh, 
Now it is the question and answer session for, for this part of lecture. In question and answer box, I have already some question uh, regarding this lecture. So first question from Dr. Asad, what is the timing of surgery in proximal humerus fracture? Uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Amjad sir to ask, answer the question. What is the timing of surgery in proximal humerus fracture? Okay. Uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Ram Chidambarum sir. Yes. Uh, what is the timing of uh, what is the timing of surgery in proximal humerus fracture? Uh, as as soon as you get to see the patient. <laughs> uh, earlier okay. the better. The question is earlier the better yeah. because uh, as yeah. uh, elegantly put out, the success of uh, proximal humerus fracture fixation or replacement depends on the tuberosities, rotator cuff insertion, etc. So if you want to do any surgical procedure, the surgery is much more easier when it is done in the acute settings. Uh, I normally recommend them to have a arm in sling and have ice pack application to reduce the primary swelling down and then carry on with your planned surgery. But if you're having a fracture, which you think it might go for replacement, don't rush in to have a war, yeah? but wait for uh, up to two weeks, you could wait without much additional damage to the your approach. Dr. Dhawal, you have to add okay. something? You can ask Dr. Dhawal Desha to add something. Yeah, else. yeah. Uh, sir, you have to unmute yourself. We can't hear. Yeah. Okay, oh. Yeah, so if you have something like a dislocation, you might think it's an emergency in the middle of the night, but I think fractured dislocation You are not audible. Uh, you really need the armamentarium and assistance to reduce and fix well. So I think don't go and sit with the fracture. Ram, you agree with that? You are not very well. Yeah, you are not. So a fracture dislocation of humerus would, would not be most appropriate to sit in the middle of the night. Yes. With not appropriate assistance yes. and, uh, and, and and you know implants or uh, more importantly assistance. So I think we would say that this is a fracture dislocation and we need to put it back right in right there. But I think that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, as, as Ram said, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, only once or twice something odd has happened is that we had a patient that the anesthetist probably assessed. They assessed or they could not and they did. They thought they'll be able to do it in a block. Now the block didn't work so greatly or so well. And his neck uh, was such that they could not, they said they can't intubate him. So they'll probably need to do a blind nasal uh, intubation if that was needed. So now it was a situation where they were not sure or happy to uh, do a blind nasal intubation. And the block was like, you know, not very sure. So I said, look, I'm not going to proceed yeah. in this situation. Mm -hmm. Well, you are not sure of the anesthesia. So I, I would need a safe anesthesia before I do on a very, so very often those are hefty, well-built patients. So you, you just can't say this is going to finish off in a block. So there's sometimes some technical issues, but otherwise I think go in and fix early as possible, except a situation where you need to replace, where I think Ram would probably advise us much better than anybody else. Yes, I think uh, the answer is clear yeah. to the uh, uh, attendees. Uh, next question uh, uh, to... Our presenter, Dr. Kaji Shoydul Alam. How does medial metaphyseal beak and medial hinge correlate with vascular differently? I think you have already answered. Uh, still now, can you clarify it? Okay, if there is a confusion, let me uh, show the picture again to explain it a little bit better. Just give me a minute, please. Yeah. Oh, it's full of questions. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. if you look at this picture, so this is the site where the medial impaction can yeah. occur. Yeah. Well, well, we, we cannot see, see anything. Oh, you cannot see, sorry. I must have not been started. Just you can explain. So now you can see? Yeah. Yes. 
So this is the site where the medial hinge or valgus deformity actually occurs. And if you see that this is where the third trifurcation actually occurs. The branches from the axillary artery, it hooks around the surgical neck of the humerus. So as I have told you, if there is a medial metaphyseal extension attached with this head, so that suppose if the fractured metaphyseal extension is up to here, so this portion is an intact part, so the circulation chances are very less to be hampered. But if any fracture occurred here, or if the head is laterally displaced and the distal fragment is medially displaced, making the medial hinge, it will disrupt this uh, the vascularity. And the chances are actually high. So that is why it is said the vulgus deformity or the medial hinge, if more than two millimeter, if occurred, then the chances of AVN are very high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, do you like anybody, uh, Dr. Dabul Deshai, do you like to add something or? I was going to ask Ram, Ram, how often you see AVN after a fixed yes. function of numerous in yes. follow-up? Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I had a case to show as well, a picture. I think the medial hinge and the metaphyxial height is taken as a guide to assess the vascularity. But that is not the key thing. Because in our experience, even a fractured, dislocated head lying in the axilla, we have put it back and fixed it. Uh, we know that it is vascular at the time. But they heal by creeping substitution. They do heal. Uh, the other thing to say is that, as uh, Dr. Dawal Desai is suggesting, Avascular necrosis in the humeral head is not behaving as like AVN of the hip. The shoulder joint is non weight bearing. So even if we have a partial avascular necrosis, the patient might not have much pain, but might be able to carry on with daily activities also. So the avascular necrosis can happen even without surgery. With surgery also can happen. The incidence is under 5%. But if it does happen, it may not be always sym symptomatic. You could just get away with the removal of implant and get going. And should you restore the tuberosities in the original place, you could even do minimally invasive procedure to nullify the pain later on. So avascular necrosis is do not treat equal to your displacement. Can I, can I, can I add a little? Yes, sure, sir. Shantanu. Actually, yes, sir. Sure. My, my practice, I get avascular necrosis whenever we are going for, I mean, uh, surgical, surgically, much more intervention. Surgical intervention and also the, as you know, that four parts fracture when the articular surface head is a small one and is been dislocated or has been uh, totally avulsed. So in that case, there is a chance, fair chance. And I found little, I mean, a few cases of avascular necrosis. Uh, Particularly dislocation when the head is completely head. I mean the articular uh, surface has uh, totally displaced, and we have also mobilized so much. So there is a fair chance of I mean uh, avascular necrosis. Otherwise, avascular necrosis is not as you say, Dr. Professor Ram. This is not a big problem for the patient because it doesn't do any harm if we go on moving, exercise early, then patients can at least uh, do the normal activity. Yeah, thank you. I think I think there is also another related question about how to reduce the uh, yeah valgus valgus impacted fracture. fracture. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, same thing. If the valgus impacted fracture is not significantly uh, displaced, you don't need to reduce. But when you reduce, you do an indirect reduction. You use a, a spike Drastic. or a, a, a spike to elevate the head, push the head towards the uh, glenoid. But you need to make sure that once you do that. You have to support the void by either the, uh, if it is acute fracture, use the locking plate and screw system, or if it is a chronic fracture delayed, the moment you elevate, you have to support it with some bone graft. Yep. Never Thank cut you. the capsule. Try to preserve the capsule as much as possible. Yes. yes. So the blood yeah. supply is intact. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for the uh, question. The, another question regarding the phyllos. When best not to use the fillers? I oh. would uh, like to. I will cover it next talk. Okay, okay, sir. We'll cover it. Uh, another question from uh, regarding Dr. Ka I like uh, asking Dr. Kaji Shwedulalam regarding displacement, greater tuberosity. Young patient is mentioned, you mentioned he had five millimeter displacement. He wants to know that as near classification is clearly said mm -hmm. that displacement should be one centimeter. So what is the clarification? Good question. Is 
less than one centimeter, it is still included is as one part or undisplaced fracture. So if the patient is young and if the, he has got five millimeter displacement, it is still counted in a one part, near one part classification. But in a young patient where the functional demand is more, it is recommended that it should be fixed. But for the elder people, we can consider up to 10 millimeter of displacement. Or it might get dissolved right. later on. So you have yes. to if yes. you check the x-ray, if there is a little bit gap on the abductive size, so yeah. you have to fix it. Otherwise, in future, you find out at the end, it has gone below the acromion. Acromion, yes. yes. It may impinge us later on. Right. Because they... Okay. And plus uh, less than one centimeter still counted as near type 1. Yeah. See, okay. the, the near, as per near classification, this, the criteria is 1 centimeter, 43 degree angulation, you call one part fracture. But I think we should treat greater tuberosity fracture on its own merit. Right. Yeah. Uh, in that criteria, because of the isolated uh, supraspinatus insertion, a 5 millimeter displacement in the posterior direction is enough to cause trouble for the patient in overhead activities in a young patient. So that needs addressing more. But the same thing happening in an elderly patient with a fracture dislocation. You reduce the dislocation, the tuberosity fall back and heal with some sort of stiffness, they will hold good. So GT fracture on its merit, please treat. Not as yeah. near treat. And, and, and I like to add here uh, that uh, whenever you have got this uh, greater tuberosity fracture with minimum uh, displacement or even maximum displacement, I have found that nobody, we, we haven't done any surgery in, in fact, because yeah, that yeah. ultimately heals most of the cases. So in my practice or in our, in, in our, uh, our career, we, I don't know how much they have been doing this call of surgery, uh, particularly double Dasha and Dr. Ram, they can mention. But I don't find any reason to fix it so much. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Only select young patients, young patients yeah. with the displacement. See, when somebody is yes. 40s, 50s, when there is associated with fracture dislocation, I do not jump. Yes. Conservative yes. one. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Agree, That's totally. Right. That's right. Okay. Uh, uh, regarding the fracture dislocation, so someone asking about that, is there any uh, uh, favorable technique for easy reduction for fracture dislocation correction? Uh, Dr. Dhabal Deshai. There is nothing like easy in that. <laughs> okay. It is always you have to take, but there are some tricks and trips that are people do. One of the things is to take a, a stitch into the uh, subscapularis and then use that as a as a as a hitch or a, or a lever to get it out, but I think um, people also you would use a shans 3.5 shans pin into the head and with with the traction and out. But I suppose there is no no easy trick to get you know it, it all depends on you know how how fat muscular is the patient and how early you got into it and how bad is your day. Ram, I agree with that. Yes, absolutely agree with that. There is also one more tip. But I've got a case scenario to show it. So it okay, sure, we'll wait for <laughs> Okay, we'll, wait we'll for see that. it later. We'll see it later. Uh, I think the greater trip Dr. Is Dr. Dabal, the, do you have any idea that we, we some, sometimes our colleagues go for, I mean, a close reduction when there is head is already not in touch and it's a head or the, that fragment or the four part fragment, the articular surface with the small fragment has been totally displaced. It is. Uh, it is not in the in the under that. I mean, uh, uh, nearby position. So, what is the utility of putting? I mean, doing close reduction because some of our colleagues they do for close reduction. Do you it? Do you suggest it? You have to be, you, you. I think you have to be really lucky to get a displaced um, fracture dislocation back to its position. I think you are almost certain for doing it an open reduction. Yes, uh, you have. You might be very lucky that you can put your arm in the axilla and the head puts mm -hmm. and pops in back yes. inside. Yeah. But yes. virtually no. I think it means that it has taken off the attachments and something is you know holding it in that reduced you know impacted position. Sometimes it's under the glenoid that it's sitting, a wedge between the so almost almost hundred almost sure that it will it will need an open reduction. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah, well, I do agree. No and need, trust for sure, there's a really strong muscular patient that they end up with fracture dislocation. And usually they are big and fat and burly. 
so you know these are like real real sweaty jobs antun go for the next talk because many okay. people are from his yeah lecture. yeah yeah this uh, i think the question that are asked in this lecture uh, i think we will get answer by the following lectures okay i will go for so, uh, before before we move can i joke ram is going to come on the ram ram yes. preferred approach for um, between delta pectoral and um, the uh, deltoid split or you or you cover in the talk uh i uh, i uh, partly will cover in my talk. okay yeah okay we'll come to that in the later yeah come okay. to that okay let me just uh, so i think we can start our second topics that is advanced uh, on proximal humerus fracture by dr ram chidambaram uh, so can you share your screen please uh yes we can see uh, sorry not that. by the way we have i have already told you that he is the director of department of shoulder elbow and hand surgery in mgm healthcare chennai and he is the president of shoulder and elbow society of india for the 2072 2021 and elected member of british shoulder and elbow society uh, for the few years so we just get this yeah got it here okay uh, let's share it okay can you see it yeah uh thank you uh, dr gibriel can you see the slide yeah you can see yes that. sir thank you dr gibriel uh, gibriel for the nice kind invitation Uh, this is when you visited us uh, last year. It was a good time. Don't know when the time going to come back for us to visit each other in the future. Until then, we have to stay with the webinars. Okay. So um, that's the uh, my talk. Uh, so uh, as uh, Dr. Deol Desai uh, suggested, uh, these are the options for a displaced three and four part fracture. You could do a minimally invasive fixation. You could do open reduction plate. Intramedullary nailing is also possible. prosthetic replacement these are all four groups of uh, uh, treatment uh, over the years uh, my preference was towards plating uh, may, maybe the reason that uh, the uh, patients treated elsewhere with uh, wires percutaneous things came with uh, problems with to me uh, this is a 74 year old uh, gentleman had a pinning elsewhere one year ago you think that okay it's all uh, reduction good uh, acceptable etc but when patient had this final outcome is like this the pin track came uh, loose infected stiff arthritic shoulder nothing could be done so we had to be uh, careful in playing percutaneous fixation and close reduction of the fracture don't forget the four guiding principles ao anatomic reduction stable fixation so as to allow early movement to get the back function the problem is shoulder is a mobile joint so you should be able to mobilize as soon as possible preservation of blood supply as much as possible early active mobilization Uh, this is my experience with the locking plate system i use three sets of uh, plates so we'll touch uh, base on all of these i started to use the first generation uh, of uh, locking plate system and it was introduced in the united kingdom in 2002 so almost have 18 years experience using this uh, we reviewed our first 102 patients treated at epsom st helier university hospital in england uh, the mean age is very high 62 years because you know the osteoporotic Uh, patients are elderly in the UK. This is the distribution of two part, three part, four part. Three and four parts were major, uh, and this is my technique as a delta pectoral approach. This has not changed over the years. Still, I prefer delta pectoral approach for uh, fracture fixation. Uh, it's a short delta pectoral approach, uh, slightly uh, shorter than usual. And this is the approach. Once you go in, you would see in a four part fracture like a sun setting sign. the articular surface pointing up and the tuberosities on either side so you gently uh, tag the tuberosities and lift the head up to reduce it the longer the biceps if it is in the way you do a tenotomy so this is how you reduce with uh, help of a pointed reduction uh, forceps to lift the head towards the glenoid tuberosity is well positioned but you see the entire control is done by the sutures these sutures are applied at the interface between the rotator cuff and the bone fragment there is no point in taking bite through the uh, tuberosity fragment as such so this is how the fellows plate is run through the uh, sutures and uh, tied over so this is the uh, uh, technique which i use for years 
And that's the lateral view. It's very important to have a lateral view on screen. So I stick to three principles. Number one, these are all different patients' x-rays I have fixed. So the tuberosity should be reduced and should be under the plate, supported with sutures. These sutures are very important. And second, the call card, which we have just highlighted already. Call card reduction is key because this is the medial pillar on which the entire construct rests. And third is, if you watch my uh, uh, operation uh, post of x-rays, all short screws, because I don't believe in putting a long screw because do not treat shoulder as like a hip. In hip, dynamic hip screw, we chase the tip apex distance. You have nothing to chase like that. It's just an anchorage for your tuberosities to heal. So this, the call card screw we talked about, because the inferior pillar reconstructed. If you have a screw biomechanically, it is stable, it is well proved. And uh, additionally, sometimes if you see the lesser tuberosity will come off, this won't be held by the plate. You could put additional one or two screws to fix the lesser tuberosity from front to back. So with this, uh, the post-operative plan for my patient is shoulder shrug, pendulum movements, assisted forward elevation is started, day one post-operative, second month full range of movement, third month muscle strengthening program. Uh, this is the uh, result of that uh, series. So all fracture heal, mean time to union is 14 weeks. There were no mall union or non-union. Some example, this is the four part head splitting fracture. As you see the CT scan, you would see the head fragment dislocated uh, posteriorly with greater, lesser tuberosities. And that's the fixation, and that's the healing at 12 months follow up. Another lady, 75 year old lady with a, a proximal femoral fracture, osteoporotic, comminuted, but with just fresh fracture. So we just treat it with a, a locking plate and it is healed to satisfaction. So this is the constant score outcome, average of 79, and that is the movement range, 135 degrees, good external rotation, and functional satisfaction was higher. We had a few complications, uh, one superficial wound infection, one case of refracture, and three cases of avascular necrosis. So let's, this is the uh, patient who treated, fell down, had a periprosthetic fracture, treated conservatively as healed. This is the other lady, 60-year-old lady, four-part fracture, you see the displaced uh, head fragment. This is the anatomical reduction and fixation, uh, following up the patient six months. As you see here, the one of the screw is going a little bit subcontinent. This is the reason I said, Though you might fix to your satisfaction, you might think, okay, but when the avascular necrosis is uh, setting up, the screw might become long because of the logging screw construct. It can only go forward. It cannot come backward. So this is, I remove the plate and screw at uh, nine months. That's the follow-up at the time. You see small segmental collapse. And then at 15 months, it is progressed and it's becoming a little bit more painful. But as you see, the advantages of reducing the greater lesser tuberosities, I did a resurfacing ultraplasty of that uh, avascular necrosis and it's done very well at the three year follow up. So, this is what the advantages uh, we concluded maintain the fixation, still healing, even in osteoporotic bone, no metal work, loosening migration, stable construct. But if you look at the literature, there was a very highly significant rate of complication, as well as the most important complication is screw cutout. These are all the uh, cases which uh, have been referred to me with, for revision. See a 42-year-old patient present with pain and stiffness one month post-operation. Uh, you might think the X-ray looks okay, but it is not because it is not an AP view. It is not a, you should have an AP and an oblique view. If you do a correct view, you would see that the screws were not locked. The plate is off, off the bone. Second case, uh, to 52-year-old patient, one month post RAF so presenting with a crunching noise. The screw is already out of the articular cartilage. Very important to recognize these and avoid because the hum proximal humeral head is like a ball and you might uh, have a, a deserting view that it is in, but it may not be in. So this another case left longer, developed a significant arthritis, and you see also uh, cavitation of the glenoid making the situation much more complex. So stick to the few principles. So these are the issues of locking plate, screw penetration, collapse of plate breakage, tuberosity problem, stiffness, avian. So we mentioned about the screw penetration. The key is, what are the technical tips to get the best is fracture reduction. You have to reduce the fracture first. This is the example of a patient, which I mentioned I will show in the talk. 38-year-old 30, gentleman had attempted surgery elsewhere for proximal humerus fracture dislocation. The surgeon couldn't reduce the head and he just closed the wound and sent to me. Uh, this, this is the uh, problem. Why? If you look at it, the head is dislocated and the patient cannot reduce, the surgeon cannot reduce even after opening because he was not aware of the anatomy. The problem is long head of biceps. This is my technical tip. In case if we have a, a fracture dislocation, 
the longer the biases is between the greater and lesser velocities, and the head is located forward or backward, it gets stuck. So you have to release and do a tenotomy and do a lateral tenotosis if the patient is younger. So this is very important. As soon as you take that long head biceps out of the place, then you put tuberosity uh, sutures and reduction, you would be able to get back the reduction. And this is the fixation with the uh, locking plate and that is his one year follow up. So sutures and reduction first. Why sutures? Because if the tuberosities are gen or gentle, small, uh, bony fragments. Uh, mostly you get this uh, fracture in osteoporotic patient. So they get fragmented, so you have to employ sutures to hold it and get the reduction first. Very, very rarely the locking plate could be used as a uh, reduction tool, but to achieve call core reduction, as you uh, uh, tighten the screw, the shaft will be pulled towards the uh, plate. But this is the exception. Otherwise, you should actually apply the plate after reduction. Do not put long screws. This is the key message from me today. Uh, five to 10 millimeter from the articular margin, as I said, is a ball. If AP view might look like it is okay, but the screw might be going from front to post anterior posterior direction. It might be already long. So you have to do a dynamic screening and do not drill until the subchondral bone because the screw could be applied without pre-tapping. This is what I mentioned. At the end of the surgery, don't worry about AP or lateral view. Do a dynamic screening. Don't cheat yourself. Move it, screen it. Look at it. If there is any crunchy noise or anything, the best time to remove a doubtful penetrating screw is at the time of first surgery. Plate positioning is important because uh, the plate position dictates the uh, position of your calcar screw as well as uh, locking screws because this pylos plate is a fixed angle locking construct. Okay. So let us see a couple of examples. A 34-year-old engineer from Dubai, again, fracture, dislocation, head fragment, anterior, uh, and that is the reduction. As I said, you put a spiky, uh, it could be a tab or screw or, or shan spin. Gently, if you put a too uh, hard, then it might uh, break the head fragment into another two pieces. So once you reduce, uh, uh, temporarily stabilize to the glenoid and then put indirect sutures and plate, and then the uh, screw fixation, put the call curve screw, that's the final construct. This you could fix it using the fixed angle locking plate. Another example, 44 year old gentleman after road traffic accident, this could be many part as you see, it's really, really fragmented, head splitting type. And this is the uh, CT and there is a 2D CT, you would see that. But this is not automatically, you should not consider that as a case for arthroplasty. This patient, we also make an attempt to fix it as much as possible. We could reduce the two head fragments. We could reduce the call card, tuberosity to the satisfaction. And that is you are repaired with the sutures and the phylos plate. And that is the result. Yes, it's not great result at three months, but it has improved a bit more at a, a later follow-up. But it is not full, but it is fine because he's got his own shoulder. Now, we talked about the AVM. So this is my patient, uh, three years after war year. As you see, good fixation of four pot fracture. The head fragment has collapsed, but you see the range of movement and also the rotation. There's no big problem. And I have advocated removal of plate and screw. And the patient is not even keen for that. She's just postponing it. So how, what are the latest advances? Next to five minutes, I'll talk about this. Number one, augmented fixation. If you, I have told already, the anterior buttress is not stabilized by a lateral plate. This is the reason why some interlocking nail has come with the AP locking. But here you could achieve that by using an additional plating from anterior. Don't think that if you put two plates, you will have stiffness. It is not. As far as you mobilize early, you would get a decent external internal rotation as well as elevation. An elderly patient or the patient coming to you late, when you elevate the head, you have a void. So I use a synthetic graft, injectable or, uh, uh, or pellet-like graft, pack it in the cavity, void created by lifting your femoral head fragment and then use a locking plate. Then augmented fixation using fibular graft is only necessary in case if you do a refractory, failed non-union or previous infected, etc. complicated case, we use this not as a routine. This is indicated if there is medial defect of the uh, calcar. If the call card is there, you go for cancellous graft. Now, the new developments is, we have told the problem with the locking plate, fixed angle. Now we have a variable angle locking plate called suture plate of, uh, from Orthrex, which I've been using for four years. So if you look at it, you have a bush locking guide and you could use the uh, locking uh, mechanism to lock into a degree. So here you can decide where the screw goes. Uh, the, is not dictated by the plate. 
as well as the Colcott screw, it is under your control. So it's that's the proximal portion of that uh, proximal plate. So this is the details, the variable push locking, and also there is an advantage of taking the bite in the cup later on, and then you can take the bite through the plate. It's a chamfer cut eyelets. So these are advantages of a variable angle locking plate. This is the next development. And we have the latest development is the CRP plate. It's been introduced for about two years and I have done over 100 cases. So this is the carbon fiber reinforced peak plate. It is providing option of multi-directional locking system because the titanium screw locking onto the peak plate. It is carbon reinforced because uh, the peak as such, the uh, mechanical properties are uh, weak. So we want to build up to the level of the particle bone. So it is carbon reinforced. It is indicated for metaphyseal fracture, not for diaphyseal fracture. You should remember that if the fracture is extending down, you should not use this. It's a radiolucent and less stress shielding. We'll look at that example. Uh, we have reviewed our first 30 patients and presented in last year's SSE meeting. So this is the uh, proportion. Initially, I used mostly for a two-part fracture, but then I got confident and used for three and four-part fracture. Average age of the patient is 53 years. This is an example of how we do exactly the same technique, but the plate is uh, uh, different. Okay, that's a three to four-part fracture. That's the operative technique, variable angle locking screws, and that's after fixation. The beauty of the system is that we are not blocked by your plate. You could have a good AP view, good lateral view, check the fracture reduction, check the length of the screw. Uh, but only thing is that you have to tell the patient that the plate is radiolucent. Otherwise, they will think that you have not put a plate but only screws. So all fractures of healed mean healing time is 11 weeks, no screw penetration, no collapse or no complication. And uh, this is the results, a couple of examples. A 42-year-old is a two-part fracture, uh, displaced, uh, just treated with this implant, and there is a range of follow-up at three months. Uh, and this is a 38-year-old uh, three-part fracture. And that is a communion, as you see. And that's the fixation with the CR peak plate. And that is a six-month follow-up. And that is a range of external, internal rotation you could get near normal. The reason is there is no much uh, uh, addition or uh, scar formation around this, unlike titanium. So that's the result in terms of constant score and average range of flexion and abduction is way better than what it was with the pylos plate in my hands. So that is the result of Oxford shoulder score. I think that uh, apart from the advantages, we have this radiolucency, which helps in intraoperative reduction as well as to check the healing when the patient comes for follow-up. Less stress shielding because the modulus of elasticity is closer to the bone. It is a wonderful tool for osteoporotic bone fractures and also biocompatible uh, and easily removable. There is no cold welding of this uh, unless, unlike the titanium locking screws. So I displaced the three and four part fracture to summarize fixation with the locking plate is my gold standard. I do accept there are a lot of ways of treating this. Uh, in my experience, stable fixation of the culcar and the tuberosity, tension band sutures, an optimum screw trajectory or the three key uh, uh, tips for success. Bone grafting, if indicated, early mobilization, good for the shoulder always. And there are some new toys like variable angle locking plate and peak plate for you to play with. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, Dr. Chidambaram, for your nice delivery presentation. So, the, regarding the question and answer question uh, from this part of presentation, I think the one question from this side, is how do you fix when proximal fragment is too small like a lunar shell? Yes, this is the thing I just want to highlight because I showed you a couple of uh, images of a patient. Number one is a 3D CT and then the next slide I showed a two-dimensional CT. So the X shell is diagnosed only on 2D CT. You have to ask for it. If you want to ask for CT scan, look at the 3D CT is not enough. 2D because sometimes some cephalic head fragment could be like X shell. Now, if you want to fix it, you could reduce that in a young patient. You fill that defect, fill the void with bone grafting. So that is number one. But in an elderly patient, if you have a shell-like head appearance, be prepared for arthroplasty. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, anything, Dr. Dhabul Deshai, would you like to add for this question? I think the peak plates look very wonderful. I think we need to be tried out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
So yeah. another question from the last lecture is when should, should we not, not use the pillows? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think the thing is uh, uh, when the five laws, you should remember, is a fixed angle locking plate. When we decide to do plating, if you use five loss plate, you should make sure the position of the plate is correct so that your trajectory of the screws will be appropriate, including the sulfur screw. And that is number one. And second is put short screws, don't put long screws. Not to use five loss. Uh, I think if you want to play with variable angle locking uh, screw, because the AO has still yet to come up with the variable angle locking screw to India. So that is one other option to use that. And the third opportunity is that in some cases where I showed you very much commutative fragmented, if, you, if your fixation is uh, not stable, you don't think like that you could uh, internally, externally rotate, then there is no point in proceeding with fixation with the phylos, then you have to resort to orthoplasty. So I tell those patients that uh, borderline cases, it will be on table decision to do orthoplasty and have the backup as well. Dr. Sri Ram Chidambaram. Yes, please. My question is to you that when you have, you have shown that, thank you very much, because you are, you are 53 year average age of the patient. Yes. And whenever the patient is more, I mean, is 80, 90 years. Yes. With, with very much porotic bone. So what to do in that case? Very much porotic bone in the elderly patient of 80, 90, very elderly. Yes, and in my to go inside. Yeah. Yeah. In in my in the in my practice personally, I would do a primary orthoplasty. Oh, you would primary orthoplasty. I wouldn't fix it. Yeah, thank you. I wouldn't thank you. probably fix it for if it's over 75 years with osteoporotic. Do you have any? Uh, I mean, uh, any um, uh, idea about uh, percutaneous spinning? Parkinson's spinning under CM oh, guy. I, I, I know guys who do it. Is uh, uh, Hertel's uh, uh, description of a percutaneous spinning, and also a modified spinning by Lester shoulder team. Uh, but in in my hand, I don't do that. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, not okay. a big fan. I do. I do a lot of cases. Yeah, I yeah. do. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. But I have to stress for uh, somebody who want to try percutaneous spinning, that is not always an easy technique either. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But when the comorbidities are there, usually yeah. with diabetes and other things, in that case, it is an easy way to do that within four weeks to five weeks, remove the KOR and then start mobilizing. Yes, yeah. because because we're talking about fixation and replacement, we're not touching the important uh, component of one component is conservative treatment. We could also yeah. leave the patient for conservative treatment. And if the patient is not doing well uh, in my practice, I would say, okay, you would change to reverse shoulder or something later on. Ah, right, right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, next question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, regarding the re fracture reduction, why medial hinge is so much important uh, for yes. uh, fixation? That is the mechanical construct. The lateral side, you are putting a plate. Medial side, you want something. If the medial side, there is no hitch, that means if there is a medial side defect, then the plate will break. It's the most common problem, the plate, there is no, you won't be able to withstand the force, the plate will break. So medial side should be continuity. So you can allow, uh, uh, Professor uh, Ralph Hettel uh, showed like, accept shortening. You could accept a little bit of shortening to hitch it, but otherwise you have to anatomically reduce and support the rest of the metaphysis to take the load. So that is why the medial hinge is very key. Thank you, sir. Ram. Uh, yes, Dr. Dhawan Deshay. Ram, has, since you were probably in the era in, in England when the, probably the proper yes. trial happened or around yes. that, so has it changed the way you practice? Uh, not much, but uh, basically uh, the proper trial is a pragmatic trial to say that if you are doubtful, about your management, whether the patient would benefit from a surgery or not, there is no need to go for surgery. Okay. This is the practical application of the proper trial in my practice. Okay. If I'm if I'm not doubtful, there's no not application of that principle. We just go ahead with surgery. But if you're doubtful, you could treat conservative. Majority of them do get better. So, so probably I think the COVID will COVID will bring up a lot of uh, examples yeah. for support COVID of the conservative. Will, COVID will automatically recruit more patients into this trial. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. So, uh, regarding uh, use of KOR, uh, what is your experience, sir? Is uh, how do you use prefer for KOR? 
fixation for yes, proximal humerus fracture. He's already covered, right? Yeah, you yes, yes, yes. uh, previously he, he can he can he can talk about it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, regarding a fixation with K wear. I don't, humerus I don't use. I have no experience. I, it, it, some, it may work in somebody's hands, but not mine. Dr. Amjad, I think he's, he's talking about it. Right? Okay. So, Dr. Amjad, sir, do you like yes. to add something about fixation no, no, no. of proximal fracture? No, my, what, is, what is said that uh, Dr. Ram said beautifully, that is the big not new technique has come up and it is uh, so good. And with this uh, phyllos plate also, and but mostly this fillet should be used in the in the middle age or early age group, but in the elderly and when there is a very much porotic bone, as I said earlier, it's very difficult to put it back and put and hold in by the screws. That's a big question, particularly after 70, 80, 90. And these patients are coming to us mostly with this elderly group of people with so much comorbidity, comorbidities. So we we can't go for a fixation. So in my hand, I, I do uh, more uh, care fixation in the elderly people, 80, 90. And I did, uh, after three to four weeks, I removed the screws, I mean, care wire uh, locally, and then I allowed the movement. And that, not bad the movement, I, I, I found is good. Because in our situation, in our environment, opening and putting this or everything, all these small fracture fragment together, is, is really cumbersome particularly elderly people. But in yeah. the younger group, as he has Ram said, exactly I do I do prefer that and I do I do it uh, with this fellows plate and position. But what he has the nightly mentioned about this wearing, I mean uh, uh, putting this susar mat, susar, susaring these fragments together. It's a yeah. beautifully, I mean a very good technique. And we should all follow it because this is one of the great things we should follow. Thank you so much. Sir, sir, Ram, only one question is mm -hmm. with the deltopectoral. Yeah. You have any challenges to getting the greater tuberosity sutures put in easily? Uh, no, no issues because that is the main workhorse approach. The alternative approach is the deltoid uh, split. But when you do deltoid split and you want to pass the plate, the axillary nerve, you have to see it, protect it pass the plate beneath. So that is the different scenario. Delta petal approach, the disadvantage, as you say, people might say that it's a greater tuberosity access. But I have not uh, encountered but the difficulty. The only two technical tips I would say is that you have to have a good deltoid retractor. Yeah. Okay. You have to have a good okay. curved deltoid special retractor that goes uh, underneath the deltoid. And then the second tip is that your assistant should be doing a little bit of abduction you insert the retractor and then you bring it down so that the tuberosity will be pushed towards you. And the third thing is that you will you are going to use only sutures. So you take a couple of sutures, you tag on the sutures to bring the tuberosity to you and then repair. So it is not an issue. That's right. And it is a workhorse approach. The reason I've said that, the stress that I, I could have shown a few delta petrol approach as well, but I insisted on showing delta petrol. Because the deltoid approach, if you do, if you accidentally damage the axillary nerve, then you are actually damaging the shoulder for permanently. So the other salvage procedures also cannot be done. So be careful with that. Delta pectoral is a standard approach. Delta standard approach. approach. Standard yeah. approach, yes. And it, the spl splitting is difficult because you have to go underneath the nerve and vessel. That's difficult. Exactly. <laughs> There's one question also, I think, is what type of dislocation is most difficult to reduce? Yeah. Uh, have you any incidents of a vascular injury? See, basically, uh, no. Uh, the answer is the anterior dislocation and posterior dislocation. If the head is uh, reduced to posteriorly, dislocated posteriorly is not an issue. If you do a gentle tug and push from the posterior aspect, the head will fall back. Anterior also, if you use this technique, sutures and uh, do a bicep stenotomy, uh, sutures on the lesser fibrosity lift up, you would be able to uh, receive it. But sometime if there is difficult, the patient comes to you after a few weeks, then you could do a coracoid osteotomy. If you do a coracoid osteotomy, you have an unrestricted access to the anterior aspect of the chest. And then you could just uh, retrieve the fragment, put it back in and repair it. Now, uh, your approach doesn't cause vascular injury, but there are some patients who come with vascular injury to us. There are some fracture dislocation I have seen with a venous injury 
Uh, actually, the vein is much more amenable for damage. I think there is maybe one case in the reverse shoulder cases, I don't know. Uh, in those cases, we do a CT angiogram pre-op if there is a suspicion, big swelling. The suspicion is not like distal pulse reduction, but it is a very huge swelling in the axilla. You just do a CT angiogram. You get the vascular surgeon also on hand to help you. But, but no role of conservative treatment, conservative reduction. Do you agree with this? Eh? Again and again, I tell you, because this is we try always, uh, some of our colleagues trying to do conservative, uh, I mean, uh, close reduction, which is impossible to reduce on a, whenever the fragment, and the head is totally dislocated, then, open it and then do it. You know, close reduction and pinning is an accepted technique practiced by some team and some surgeons throughout the world. So we cannot say that it is not possible. It is possible, but you have to try and practice and get good at it. Santur, go for the next talk. I think, I think we will go for the next talk. Uh, next talk will be by uh, Dr. Dabul Deshai. Brief, yes, so uh, we, case presentation. Oh, can, can, can you hear me on this? I need to take yeah. this. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. We can hear clear. So I think this is just an interesting case uh, that I think I would like everybody to opine on. Um, so this is a gentleman who's about 83. Um, unfortunately, he just stays one uh, one bungalow across the across my house, which means he's a patient that you will see every every day, every week. And uh, this gentleman had um, uh, he has multiple comorbidities. So he has uh, CRF, diabetic. His ejection fraction was about between 20 and 25 percent. And uh, he fell um, before about three and a half years and he had a, a comminuted uh, extra-articular proximal humerus fracture, which, which after, um, you know, with a lot of deliberations and a lot of consultations, he eventually, he has also had a stroke that has recovered on the same side. So there is some neural deficit on that side. He eventually op opted for surgery and this was his, his, his fixation. So this was a comminuted uh, extra articular proximal humerus uh, fixed with, uh, with with a with a bridging principle, and to about five months he was progressing well with 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 union. Ram, would you Ram your query with this kind of fractures? Do you do you have anything else to offer? Like would you wire these uh, for more stability, or would you bridge this? Is that it's okay. 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 I don't have the pre -op. I don't have the, sorry, I don't have the pre -op. 83, the, the fracture is very long. Yes. The fracture segment is very long, so it is supported by a long plate, proximally and distally. Yeah. So we just need to watch the space. Okay. But in, if it was primary, would you wire, wire or would you, would you put in some screw in, in, the, in the middle segment? Hello. It's, it's basically, basically, it is like a essentially shaft fracture uh, right. in 83 year old uh, to uh, to expose. Uh, I think I don't know how this approach was done here because it is a pretty this long approach from top. No, it, top it was to bridge. It, it was a bridge across. It was obviously it a is, bridge approach. Yeah. Uh, yeah bridge. If it is a bridge approach, then it it probably would uh, work. If I was operating, I would reduce the fracture with the wire, and at least put a screw so that. In the middle, it holds. So I think that I think I, I would I, the dilemma, as Ram said, was the large, big segment right. that that is bridged across by a plate, and sometimes sometimes it can fail, or, or you know it can put stresses on on the prox, especially on the proximal screws. Okay, here we have. Okay, so no, this gentleman, good. it, it looks good. good. Yeah, yeah, it it yeah, was pro it, it was progressively progressively healing. So it wasn't yeah. like it was not doing. Oh, no, 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 it's, okay. it's, it's good. So. So after five months, this gentleman fell off a escalator uh, while uh, while being in another city in Delhi, mm. and he came back with this. Mm. That may happen. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah, he looks had like a second injury. injury. He had a second fall. So this is a yeah. new fracture because the proximal, the first fracture was a long segment, yes. and so exactly. this bone was obviously he was healing. It wasn't not healing because you have a, now have a butterfly in a transfer, so it's from a C type, it's become a B type. Um, his comorbidities don't change, he's the same. Okay. 
So he still he still twenty percent ejection fraction, and um, not very best candidate for surgery. So and and what would you think of? Would you put him in? An, um, it the you 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 spleen won't work over this. Okay, this this displacement will not be corrected with a with the standard cast. So the only option I thought was a was an aeroplane spleen. Um, anybody treated any of these Ram any time in your in your shoulder carrier? You treated yes. with aer aeroplane. Aeroplane is very, very, very difficult, cumbersome spleen for patient to hold it. <laughs> yeah, true, 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 true. I have treated only once, and yeah. that guy has gone on to do well. But it's a very but cumbersome. The problem, the problem is that the sharp edge of the plate is the issue, isn't it? The yeah. proximal yeah. fragment, broken yeah. plate is the problem. If it's yeah. a fracture, it yeah. can uh, heal in the spleen. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Keeping the plate fracture healing is difficult. Anyway. Um, Keeping the plate. Yeah, yeah. The that, plate. So anyway, yeah. So he he, he he deferred surgery for a while. So this is another at two months further on. Obviously, no progress of the healing around the line. Okay. In the middle, he was bad with his uh, CRF, so he had some issues. Um, this is about five months. Not happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is like further. So now. Would you push this guy for surgery, like, or would you would you would you want him to get you know ins insist upon? So he's now six months after the fall. Seven months. This is this is an X-ray. <laughs> <laughs> he, he has got a problem. He has got few problems. Number one is the fracture that failed to heal. Now he's got also additional problem of a broken plate with a sharp edge under yes. the uh, skin. Yeah, but he's he spent seven months. Okay, he's not come yes. to you very frequent. Okay. So, all, all, all depends on whether you could take him for an anesthesia and do a major surgery with the risk. I, that, that, that was the major concern, I think. There was somebody with yes. a 20% ejection fraction, all the risk. And uh, the other other bonus of him just staying across your house. So you don't want to see him <laughs> daily. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so the limit is to decide. Yes. He had another fall ah. at home. Uh -huh. Now what? Uh, oh, oh, oh. oh dear. <laughs> Who is a very close friend to you? <laughs> he likes you very much, Dr. Desai. <laughs> Keep coming back to you. Again and again. So now, he wants to come back to Dr. Desai. Yeah, I know, but this is now you kind of. Now it's a, it became painful. He was managing before that without much pain. And now this became, you know, pretty painful. So this still fracture, um, extra articular again, fortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, but now, somehow, he uh, he, you know, so he would you fix this or would you conserve this now? I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm <not> really <laughs> afraid enough to do anything to her, to him. It's very difficult to do anything. So the major concern again was, you know, he's 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 a twenty percent. He's he's stable at twenty percent. So some of this, I don't know. You must have seen Ram. This twenty percent ejection fraction are the ones who are the best patients, I think, <laughs> because yeah. because they've been stable. Yeah. They usually don't do anything, you know, with 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 all the modern uh, anesthetics um, care and the good, you know, good the anesthesia and anesthetics are now pretty brilliant and bright. Usually they don't have an on. And cardiologist and, and, should be in the operation room. Cardiologist nah. should be in the operation room. We usually don't keep one. Do you keep a cardiologist in the operating room? <laughs> what would he do? <laughs> very close by. MS I, do, I, do, I do, I do, I do. If they want, the, the anesthetics can obviously use the paddles, but otherwise, I mean, what would the cardiologist do? Uh, damage control x fix under local anesthesia. So it's like, Either you do something or you don't do something. So these half-hearted measures would not round. So the once, once the anesthetist said, you oh, know, in a in a big big corporate setup that we are happy and the patient also understood all the risks. We said no, we got to do it. So once he's under the sleeve, then there is you better finish everything and come off, right? So, yeah, it's, it's, that's that's important. I think the anesthetic challenge is there, but surgical challenge is also there. Yeah, of course there is. I'm not we saying. Have, I'm not saying. They, there is a two, two. The proximal uh, fracture plate has to be removed. The middle yes. section plate has to be removed. 
and yes. then uh, this skull fracture has to be addressed yep. right so we have yeah. to do a combined approach you have to take out the i'm just thinking uh, the yeah. top plate and screw should be removed and then replating with the shortening of the proximal uh, fracture site and then fix the supracondylar fracture from the back so that so the two plate two, so the two two. plate should be overlapping yeah one of yeah the That's or maybe double good. plates at posterior maybe you might need double plates posteriorly because yes. of yes with that is is osteoporotic is not definitely not the best of bone around that yeah because the distal it is not enough for nailing so i wouldn't try no nailing. no this is not a nailer this is not a plate yes. on the line so anyway we finally mustered courage to you know um, get in uh, once the you know the the anesthetic and the car everybody gave him fit enough and he understood his family understood around that so we removed the um, plates and the screws with the, uh, the same incision that were there before we could get a good reduction we used a slightly longer plate than the last time okay uh, we packed the medial side with chronos uh, i was thinking of putting a fibula in there um, but, but that was too to to maribund to maribund to do something in his case so i once i got a good contact and a good uh, this thing i said no i will trust on the contact plus whatever i put in and grafts and then i turned him um, lat prone or lateral and then we fixed with dual plates on on the posterior aspect mm -hmm. okay and um, yeah very communicated so so the what it looks like a simple uh, oblique fracture is not it is those bones are just you know you put in this thing and it crumbles in your hand but with double plates we could sufficiently manage to get you know get a reasonable hold around and come out alive of the problem uh, this is him slowly progressing 3 months this is him at 5 uh, uh, now he's in been the lockdown so but i see him daily because he just stays across the road so i can see him in walking in the he's walking the, comfortably <laughs> yes 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 and he thing. hasn't deteriorated <laughs> anything and <laughs> in with the with the severe covid nothing has happened to him so you know you would be a, a very sitting candidate for a disaster if anything happened in the covid with him so i think these are real <laughs> some huh? any 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 anything yeah yeah ram i think is excellent result dr desa but it's still the not my my concern is that it started off with the percutaneous technique right <laughs> yes <laughs> so i think i think when we have a long segment the fracture and all then sometimes it is imperative to see the end and put few lax screws in the proper plating might I even so. uh, help him who could have helped him a lot i think so maybe maybe this is one of the messages probably i would think in this kind of fractures or or maybe i mean this is a difficult area to oh, wire but some people uh, or it could have, or it could have even left conservative would have healed maybe, maybe. We, we initially we gave him about 3 weeks so he, it wasn't it wasn't so he actually he went around shopped around and then he came back again so it was like you know he he was said no now finally you only do it you know that's kind of thing so but you know this is sometimes these are the hard lessons that you learn from anyway so this is yes. i think this was interest thank you Well, thank you very much. So really, what two questions to ask? Appreciable job you did. Now, people has put two questions for you. you yes, asked. please. One second. One second. Let me. Let me second. Let me come out of this. Okay. Yes. Okay. The first question is that what is the soft tissue condition of this case? I think we can. So soft tissue was good all the way because we didn't disturb too much in the first surgery, and then he had enough time to heal the soft tissue because he waited six months. No. Uh huh. after the first second breaking break of his um, fracture he did not come next day he waited for a long time so everything was nice and supple okay and uh, asking about how did you uh, handle the radial nerve yeah how did you manage the radial nerve how did you bypass i mean pass through did it come so with, with the with the anterior lateral plate in the anterior plate the radial nerve uh, didn't come right it hasn't come because we not gone yeah. that distal distal part of the uh, incision and it's still between the two uh, it been the brachioradialis uh, muscle that you have split and gone in mm -hmm. and the prox and the, in the posterior approach this was by paratricipital 
right. so yeah. so it was both sides of the triceps and we didn't go high up to you know but on the lateral gutter we could see, we did not reach we did not reach that high up uh, to see the radial now otherwise we were you know we could have that's why to paratricep it but it was a small plate down uh, the small plate there are two us. plates one small and one long so we, yeah, yeah. the yeah, lateral yeah. pillar we use a longer plate the medial pillar yeah. we just bridge that across because the, it wasn't permitting for a longer plate yeah but these are like never these are one of situation these are like ones where you have to take a decision and some adaptation have to come up and i think some of the modern plates are very essential in these kind of fractures i think the story is still not over because you know he is i <laughs> I'm I'm just waiting for him to come over after you know and get his X-ray done. Maybe very soon I'll post it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir, for nice. The challenge is uh, with so the challenge is with with proximal humerus uh, fractures uh, are one is are the are the elderly patients where we are not sure of the rotator cuff. So there's probably Ram will probably tell the answers in the next talk probably is. Is there are some fractures where you know these are 70, 75, where hemi replacement is not fantastic because um, you know uh, there are there are limitations because you don't know the you know how the cuff is functioning and how. So I think there are there has to be some some better options um, yeah. to managing those patients. And and the reason why is because now like hip fractures, patients are living longer. So you know like they want a good hip walking function, they also want a good shoulder function when they break it. Right, so the the, the the octogenarian challenges are, I think, still 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 with us, Ram. Right? Are we agree? Yes, yes, agree totally. So you have another okay. question. Somebody asked you, was, was it trauma or osteoporosis? Uh, not which one? The first one, both one. I mean, after the se uh, second and third fracture, they the all were falls. The first time he fell on the, the first time he fell at on on in his uh, he has a garage. He fell on a he came out of his two wheeler and he's twisted. Okay. Uh, the second time he fell on a railway escalator and the third time he fell on the down his stairs. So, so both all all doc all doc yeah of course <laughs> but all documented falls. Okay. So Shantan, if there are no more questions go for the but, reverse. Yeah, uh, 20 percent ejection fraction is a real challenge I think it is but I, I, I still yes, feel 20, yes. 20 percent ejection fractions are good patients. They usually won't, won't turn a hair um, on table. Because everybody is prepared, for, everybody is prepared for him. You, yes. you are best prepared for him, I think. That is the reason. Um, All your sir, antennas are high, high up. I have a question uh, regarding the yes, uh, filos plate. Yeah. Um, uh, on both of you, Ram sir and uh, the yes, sir. sir. That is the, the proximal uh, screws that is placed on the uh, proximal humerus. The Ram sir showed that it can be shorter than subchondral bone. Uh, is it uh, like that or? Uh... So once Ram has said, I also now to rethink now because if Ram is saying it will be shorter, then I have to really yeah. rethink one when I'm putting, <laughs> I'm putting mine next time. <laughs> See, the thing is, I'm just stressing on that because that's the yeah, yeah. total 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 thing we stress it. But the yeah. condition is, if you look at it, if it is a ball and yeah. you have a plate, then uh, the fixed angle, the pylos is a, a fixed angle locking screw system. So the anterior posterior screw, there are two that goes anterior and posterior. They might be actually very close to the articular cartilage, which even you might not see on the AP view X-ray. So that is why when you screen or take an X-ray, you should never see any screw which is very closer to the articular surface, which might be actually uh, very deep. Yeah. So that is why uh, we just stress at least to five to ten millimeter. The second thing is that, like the distal radius fracture fixation, you have a subchondral support. For hip, you need a subchondral support. But here, we are not expecting any big subchondral support because the the ball, the humerus is the ball and socket joint. It has to rotate. The tuberosity is healing to the head fragment to the shaft. This is the our only aim. So this uh, support of the screw is only like a scaffold. Can I add one thing? And the uh, final thing is, it is a locking construct. So if something happens, if a avascular necrosis happens, collapse happens, what will happen to the screw? The screw right. cannot back up. In a, another scenario as a buttress plate, tibia, whatever it is, if it is not happening, the plate, the screw will unscrew and then you will see the prominent screw, you will take it out. Here, it has to travel only cephalic direction. So it goes. Yes. 
That is why if you look at it, pilos break, the commonest complication is screw penetration. So the true, two things true. you could do, yeah. one is put short screws. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Then second thing is that think about variable angle locking screws because you are not dictated. You could change the direction. Can I, yeah. can I add one thing? In yes. my personal practice, I usually, because I thought the longer screw doesn't help because we are passing through the, the cancellous bone. So my aim is to hold the plate along with the bone. So make it and hold it. Exactly. And putting lot many screws will hamper the circulation as well. So yeah. avian chances are more. So I usually put three to four like that so that the purchase is there. It gets on hold so that because somebody else was asking about why the avian happens. Avian one is the reason is the vascular injury is there and putting too much screws if there is some uh, avian so that is going to penetrate through the cartilage and injure the benoid. Yeah, so that's, that a, that's a very good point of exactly. the because we have seen some patients uh, fracture treated with a nine, ten screws. Right. Yeah. All the nine, nine screw slot is there in the profile of plate. You put all the nine, you don't need to because that only really increase the stiffness of the construct and doesn't actually help much to towards healing of the bone. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you are very right that you have to be very particular in screw penetration on table. You really have to see in everything yes. before it come out. Absolutely. And the sutures are more important than the screws as well for this holding. Yes. 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 Please. Okay. So uh, we'll go for the last, uh, start for the last presentation. That is four part proximal humerus fracture. Uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty as a primary treatment for the shoulder treatment of uh, four part fracture. Sir, Dr. Ram Chidambar. Thank you. Uh, so, we have just touch base, touching on uh, shoulder arthroplasty for fracture. I have selected only acute fracture. I have not included fractures equally or failed treatment, failed plating, etc. indication to make it very clear concept. So, the indication for replacing a shoulder in a fracture scenario, in my experience, is that it, the fracture is not fixable or there is a compromise to vascularity of the head fragment, or you have done a, a plating is failed. So the likely conditions this happen is this four part anatomical head fracture, fracture dislocation, head splitting fracture, impression fracture, more than 40% head involvement, elderly osteoporotic fracture. But I said likely condition because the situation is helping, you should try to help the bone to heal. That is our nature first aim. So let us see this 50 year old. Age is not a criteria. This is a 50 year old, four part commutator, displaced fracture fragment. And this is the CT scan, head into three, four fragments. Again, yes, I took him to theater to try to fix it, but no way I could fix to my satisfaction. My satisfaction means I should be able to mobilize the patient, not putting in uh, immobilization. So I did a trauma hemiarthroplasty. I think Dr. Zawal Desai has touched on it. The trauma hemiarthroplasty is a much difficult operation than a regular hemiarthroplasty because you have to get a lot of things right. The most important thing, key is, I'll point out, you should use a dedicated proximal humeral trauma stem to get the best result. And also the head is marked here and the tuberosity is here. The tuberosity should sit below the summit of the head. This is the key point for a success in trauma hemiorthoplasty. Thing to look at the immediate post-op x-ray. This is the patient at one year. He's a 50-year-old engineer from Dubai. So this was the treatment. So you see, see still uh, you have a good uh, tuberosity, which is well healed. The tuberosity has to heal both between each other as well as to the shaft. So that should be good bone quality for repair. That should not be a gross instability. The patient having a dislocated uh, shoulder for six weeks, like that position is putting inherent risk of that replaced shoulder as well to dislocation. Glenoid should be intact or should be a fixable fracture. Rotator cuff should be good or a repairable small tear. But you had to get all these things right. You had to get the height correct. There are particular parameters we use. You can measure from the pec major insertion height if you retain it. The medial cork or height also is around five uh, uh, millimeter. Opposite humerus, you can take x-rays and compare. But the most important thing I would suggest is to do a trial reduction with the tuberosities in place and uh, use the system which you have, like this system I use has got a marking. So you know where it is uh, inserted into the uh, proximal humerus stem, put the tuberosities back, have an x-ray, check the stability, then real, Reality put the real stem up to the correct mark level. Version is important because that brings the rotation to you. Grafting is important because if you have to heal the tuberosity side to side as well as vertical, 
as you see here, the tuberosity has to heal greater to lesser, and both greater to lesser has to heal with a sharp. So he had to do a robust uh, sucklage technique. But whatsoever you do, the hemiotroplasty itself is not always good, as the proportion of patients remain painful. Either they are extremely good if the tuberosity is healed, no problem. They could do everything. They're better than reverse. But if they are not better, they just hunch the shoulder. Pain relief will be there, but not completely. And the tuberosity can fly off. The tuberosity migration, if it happens, it damages the entire outcome. It will lead to automatically poor results. The patient will not be able to lift the arm up. So this is an eight-year-old. We have been talking about the elderly osteoporotic patient with a smashed shoulder. If this patient comes to me, uh, I would not go and try to repair it. this. I would just go for a primary reverse shoulder. But uh, partly the reason is that I'm a dedicated shoulder upper limb surgeon. I've been doing shoulder orthoplasty for many years. But it is a good indication uh, for fracture. But originally, if you look at reverse shoulder, it is described for cuff tear arthropathy where the uh, cuff is deficient, the shoulder is operating, it is no longer controlled. So what we do here, we are shifting the center of rotation from the humeral head to into the glenoid by putting a sphere on the glenoid. The humeral side is the cuff that follows. So the F, it is force, and L is the lever arm. Both these, F and L, is the force and the lever arm for the deltoid is increased and the shoulder is stable. So it is a stable, constrained shoulder replacement which is giving more power to the deltoid to move the shoulder. So also, because of the center of rotation is medialized, we have the anterior posterior segment of the deltoid are now recruited for forward elevation. So the patient will effortlessly move the shoulder after you do the reverse shoulder orthoplasty. Uh, this is just an animation to show that uh, if somebody, I think Dr. Gibria said that there are some postgraduate trainees as well to show them what is reverse shoulder. So this is what we do. We uh, prepare the glenoid. There are different types of uh, base plates available. You put, a, you put a plate, fix it with screws. It's an uncemented system for the glenoid. We put a base plate. And the next step is uh, to prepare the humerus. In the fracture scenario, you could just prepare it uh, straight away because it is already uh, done up to the mark. So once you do that, you get a sphere that goes onto the glenoid base plate. So that's a glenosphere. So now the ball is on the glenoid side. The center of rotation lies within the base of this sphere. Then you do the prosthesis on the humeral side. This is the uh, uh, cocktail orthopathy version. In our scenario, you would repair the tuberosities onto this and build up the system. We have a liner, we have a spacer. It is cup-shaped poly liner, and you reduce the shoulder. So this is the completed reverse shoulder orthoplasty where the humerus follows the glenosphere. Now, RSA survivorship for 10 years is 97% for the cuff group and 88% for the fracture sequelae group. But it has been, uh, uh, we have been allowed to use this for fracture in UK from the year 2006, and it was approved in US and Japan only later on. So it's only picking up, but it is the most commonly performed of all shoulder replacement throughout the world. You take UK registry, Swedish registry, no doubt reverse shoulder is increasingly being done. And this is the indication for reverse shoulder. And we are talking about only one indication of that is the fresh fracture. So what is the indication? For me, the patient is very elderly, severe osteoporosis or comminuted tuberosities beyond reconstruction, poor cough, example like an eight-year-old patient or associated glenoid fracture instability or a pathological fracture or a failed scenario. But I'm just telling this one for this year, fresh fracture scenario. The results are predictable. The, uh, the patient will be able to do as, as average 130 degree forward flexion extension and the tuberosity healing. In doing reverse shoulder, we do not bother about the greater tuberosity fragment that is attached to the supraspinatus. We excise that. We don't need to retain that. But we still need the tuberosity fragment that is connected to the infraspinatus that has to heal, but it has to heal only side to side. Because there is no deforming force, it heals well. So the healing is much better than the hemi. This healing is important for stability of the system as well as patient ability to do external rotation. External rotation is very important in day-to-day -day life and you have to restore it. That is why the tuberosity is repaired here. So the advantages are clear-cut. 
the patient can do early rehab. No need to worry about tuberosity issues. Better functional results in terms of pain and function, better tuberosity healing, and remission rate, hopefully less. But you should know that you should be aware that you should have experience with the reverse shoulder and shoulder replacement and the approach to glenoid before you jump on to do reverse shoulder for fracture purpose. So when to consider, we have already covered it. How to do this? This is all uh, related to glenoid measurement preparation. This is not applicable for a fracture scenario because the glenoid is intact. Uh, we can do both anterior delta petrol and superolateral approach, but we just skip the superolateral approach here. It, uh, it can be easily done also by superolateral approach. I do both approach, but for the familiarity of the trauma surgeons, I have just chosen to show the delta petrol approach here. This is the uh, weak chair position. Uh, advantage of a uh, delta petrol approach is a universal, utilitarian, extendable, should the fracture happens, etc., distally, because the fracture scenario sometimes we not you may not know the shock could be extending fracture. Whatever approach you do, you should have a good glenoid exposure that is key for this uh, success of this operation. And there are four, at the moment, I don't know about Bangladesh, what exactly systems are available, uh, Dr. Gabriel, but we have four to five systems available. Each and every system is different, so you should familiarize with that. And the central fixation also different, maybe peg, maybe screw, maybe pin, and the screws as well. But important screws are uh, for Asian uh, shoulder, it is the superior inferior screws are much more important to get the fixation. So this is an example of a 69 year old lady gynecologist, doctor had a four part fracture, comminuted, fragmented tuberosity, same side she had a lateral condyle fracture with a shear pattern. So this is the extent of fracture. Now, this is close to 70 year old. No, uh, and would you be able to fix? You shall already have some arthritic changes in the glenoid. So I decided to do the primary reverse and also fix this coronal shear pattern fracture. So this is the glenoid exposure. As I said, it's a delta petal approach. You could take the head out. If you take the head out, you have a good exposure. And that's the base plate insertion, glenosphere insertion, tuberosity repair, as you see, side to side. You could see the articulation right in there. So that is the deltoid retractor on, the, on your right side, retracting the deltoid muscle. And that's the closure. Uh, you could reasonably do in a four inch uh, incision. Uh, so that is very important thing is this, because the stability is dependent only on the deltoid and the articulation. So you have to make sure that the shoulder is stable at the end of the operation. The most common complication of reverse shoulder is the dislocation or instability. So if, it, if you find it uh, loose at this point, uh, or you could do x-ray as well to check it, you can increase the tension of the system by playing with the insert, with the line, with the angle, et cetera. So it is very important to check this, reciprocate all the movement patient possibly do like getting up from the chair, et cetera. So I then uh, play to the lateral condyle from the postrolateral direction with the screws. And that is here at the three months follow up. You see the great tuberosity fragments are sitting there below the prosthesis, but you see that in one year, it is nicely reconstituted. So that becoming like an anatomical uh, approach. So I think uh, we had a video, I think, uh, I think uh, so this just shows the video, we just skip and uh, show the essential steps. I hope, uh, that's the uh, cephalic vein is usually retracted laterally because the vena committees came from that. So that's your uh, interval. Okay, so as you open that, that is a head fragment. Okay, so we're just showing it. The tuberosities are tagged, head is removed, very small head fragment. And use that to take the bone graft, not discourage. So that's the tuberosities as you see. And I'm just putting sutures now. Uh, these sutures are slightly different because we are putting the suture from out in, out in direction because we want to tag and then place the proper suture at the end of the operation to repair it back. Then we do the uh, greater tuberosity. So we have done both. You see the greater tuberosity with the retractor. Uh, it, it just comes easily. So that's the greater tuberosity phase. If there is a degenerative rotator cuff on the top, you could just uh, uh, resect it. But these are the set of sutures to control it. So once you do that both out, then you prepare the humerus, which is looking out. And this is the version. Uh, I normally uh, do the patient's native version. Basically, you look at the anterior part of the uh, plane of the uh, bicep that you drew plane, and then relate to the forearm. So you could restore the patient's neutral version, which in this case around 20 to 30 degrees. So once you do that, you go back to the, uh, the uh, okay, we just move it back. 
Uh, this is I'm showing border. If you do a if you do a, a trauma hemi, uh, this sort of scan more useful because you put that there are one two three four mark. So you can put that trial. You check where is the level. Then you mark that relation to the metaphyseal spike and put the real in the correct depth. So that's the uh, trial process is shown. So now we are. Now we are putting the base plate and this is a different system with a circular base plate. So we have put the base plate with the screws with the glenosphere screwed in. So once that is done, this is the uh, trial. So you put the trial in, reduce it and then you see the mark. I'm just showing the mark where the metaphyseal uh, edge comes in. So you mark that and you have to put the real prosthesis up to the correct level. So now we are ready, just take it out. That's how the uh, tuberosity sits. You take the uh, some tag sutures in the proximal lateral femoral cortex to affect vertical suturing of the tuberosities. If this cemented, always cement because you had to cement the distal aspect to hold the to prosthesis to length. And then proximally, you remove all the excessive cement because you want the bone to incorporate. You can impact with a lot of uh, humeral. Uh, head bone graft chips you take it from the head fragment put it between the tuberosities fix the uh, liner and the spacer appropriate for the patient even at this point you do a trial if it is okay only you do the final process now the process the reason is complete this is the real prosthesis we are doing i will be doing a lot of uh, repeated uh, trialing because that is very important now the shoulder is reduced and as you see the tuberosities will be repaired on to one to one now Let's see that here, yeah. So we're just checking the movement now. We see the forward, backward rotation. The patient would be doing unrestricted active elevation up to 90 degrees from day one post-operative. I let them do pendulum movements and the elbow hand movement also from day one post-operative. At four weeks, they will start full movement. So this is the side-to-side -side repair of the tuberosities. So they are now together. Okay, so now okay. this is the Select same movement. patient, same patient that we okay. showed the video. So that is the range of movement at one month post-operative. Something, something which we can't expect with any other uh, treatment. The, you can see the sideways All movement the for one okay. month. Duration. So few cases, just a glimpse. It is not always elderly. Sometimes you get a 57 year old lady like this, two months after fracture, smashed the shoulder. So this sort of uh, fracture combination is not successfully treated by hemiarthroplasty. So I just removed the fragment, I did the reverse shoulder. You see how the tuberosities could be reconstructed around the prosthesis. And that is a range of movement, right shoulder, one year follow-up. Fracture dislocation, somebody was asking, I told, okay, this case is here, luckily. 65-year-old lady fell from scooter. I see the head fragment out in the axilla, wide dislocation. You see the swelling, extensive swelling there in the axilla. In this particular scenario, I asked for a CT angiogram. As you see, the axillary vein uh, is compressed by the cephalic head fragment. So we have to do the operation straight away, remove the head fragment. The vein got decompressed and we did the reverse shoulder. So that's the, uh, in those scenarios, you do the regular approach. If the vascular surgeon needs to do something, patch or drop, then let them, we'll do a coracoid osteotomy to give him unrestricted view and access. So this is the after surgery, and that is the before and after the situation. And uh, that's the patient that one year follow up. Okay. So why not reverse more brief, a uh, few more slices, slides. Uh, it's a learning curve to this operation. This is not a normal operation at all. It's a salvage procedure and no much further option if something happens. Complications are all high. So these are the complications, dislocation of 20%, notching of the scapula, nerve injury, infection, and the glenoid humerus, acromion fracture, all these things can happen. Base plate component loosening is usually part of a, a learning curve or it has happened uh, in the, uh, early part of the operation or early part of the development of this reverse shoulder prosthesis. But it is not like that. Even in the best of the best hand, the reverse shoulder can go for repeated complications. One complication invites another complication and it goes on and on. The, uh, this is one of my patients that in rheumatoid arthritis fell down and dislocated. We have to revise the glenosphere uh, revision with the larger sphere. The scapular notching is because of this uh, 
the proximal metaphysis coming into contact beneath the glenosphere. Now we we don't uh, the uh, we have a lot of things to improve it, uh, like this putting a large head, is the chemispial lateralization. There's quite a lot into about scapular notching uh, here. Acromion can fracture because this is one of my patient, a young patient I did for a failed sequelae, and this patient had some small vague pain. Uh, because he went on gardening and doing a lot of heavy activities. If you look at it, the deltoid is under tension, so constant force, the uh, acromion can crack. But this patient has done well, but sometimes if the patient fall over, the acromion fracture because it is under tension load now. In those cases, we have to operate. Intraoperative fracture can happen, and sometimes periprosthetic fracture too. Is one of my patients had a successful uh, reverse shoulder, but fell down, broke at the tip of the prosthesis. They don't do well, so I had to put a plating. Nerve injuries can happen because of stretching, because as you see, the shoulder is uh, stretched, arm is longer, but they usually settle down. A hematoma infection also to be uh, looked at, and uh, don't hesitate to drain the hematoma because there is a dead space created. That is why we say to repair the tuberosities and subscap if possible. So as a learning curve, experience with the cochlear arthritis helps you. Attention to detail. Fresh fracture is okay, but fracture sequelae, you have to be very careful because you don't want to damage the axillary nerve. Then the whole system will not work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramji Dambaram, sir, sir, for very advanced presentation. Thank uh, you. Yes, Dr. Kibriya, sir, we cannot hear you. You have to unmute. Dr. Kibriel enjoyed this uh, surgery. Yeah, not very, uh -huh. very common. We have yeah. few cases this... of uh, shoulder arthroplasty, but the implants are not available here because yes, unless... yes. You, told, you told me. Yes. Yeah, but that is the reason. But this issue I brought up because people go to Singapore, some other places come back, at least we have to follow them up. So mm -hmm. people must know what reverse shoulder is and at what to do. Yes. Yeah. Not to be scared of it. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Double, you want to make some comment on that? So this is a terrific case, I think. I, I know I know now what to do or who to refer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> kind of you. I think Dr. Dr. Gabriel was very much impressed with the reverse shoulder arthroplasty work done here in Chennai. So uh, it's interesting. Thank you. Amdar sir, you want to make some comments? Uh, well, uh, I know it that reverse shoulder arthroplasty is going on around the globe, and we have not yet started uh, in Bangladesh, you but will. I saw it in other places. So thank you, Dr. Ram. We are really a good presentation, at least for our fellows here in Dhaka, in Bangladesh. We have seen it, uh, your presentation, and we have been uh, understanding about this reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, this is a good start, I think, we'll be starting Absolutely. it. Absolutely, I think I think it's a, it's a, it's a way forward. Uh, it's a good operation for somebody cocktail arthropathy, etc. As well, that was the original planning. Uh, original planning for this uh, operation is cocktail arthropathy uh, or arthritis with uh, cocktail or failed plating sequelae. You would have a lot. Okay, uh, we don't know what to do. We had been doing some sort of operation, but not good. So this is one of the operations which is very good, but there is a learning curve, uh, etc. But uh, from uh, Shoulder Society of Shoulder Elbow Society of India, we we warmly welcome any of your members if they want to join us for yes. uh, uh, to improve your learning and have exposure to the uh, developing uh, shoulder elbow. Yeah, yeah. In India. yeah. Thank you, thank you. We our definitely our boys will be expecting to meet you when then the the old Julia colleague would be doing it. We need to develop day by day. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good play. Everything yeah, starts small and then grow big. And thank you for your pay, for your that uh, presentation. We have seen that the, the head is in the axilla, which is not at all. That is why I was emphasizing, you see, this sort of cases yes, yes. my colleague are uh, trying to reduce close reduction. How oh. can you get back <laughs> it? <laughs> I had to remove it by putting one incision in the axilla and then going inside and uh, the head was taken out. <laughs> so, thank okay, you. thank you. Okay, thank you. So far there is no question regarding this uh, presentation. So I think uh, we can end our uh, keep thank a you. conclusion of our session.
before yeah. uh, thank you it was it was, a, it was a pleasure bhavuk the chat to make some comments yeah there, there was a, i think there was a very fantastic spectrum of uh, shoulder problem that been shown especially what ram has shown the whole range from uh, this thing um i think this is this is good knowledge to share thank you ram thank you and yeah. thank you, thank you very much. I think, uh, aoa bangladesh i think yeah. good to yeah. see you AOA friends so ram was asking what is aoa airlines dr amjad he is the yeah. i'm chairman of our core committee excellent everything excellent. this region dr dhawal desai he has been helping us a lot he is in ahmedabad he has been hosting lot of our boys in his hospital yeah i keep on telling the boys dr. that dr. i have Kimriya. to come to bangladesh dr. 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 i met you dr dhawal desai <laughs> Dr. Jawal Dasha, I met you in in 2010. I went to your home. You invited me. Then you took to your clinic. You have your own clinic. You are probably mistaking me for my uncle um, <laughs> in Ahmedabad. <laughs> the senior is no more. Okay. I'm from oh, Surat. Yeah. All the persons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Father yeah. Desai. Yeah, yeah, Prabodh Bhai. I'm from Surat now. But a lot of your fellows come to me. That's that's how I um, connected. You are now in Surat. Yes. Uh, He was always in Surat. I was always in Surat. He But you're Surat, you're talking yeah. about what is your uncle? Yeah, 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 your uncle. Senior professor okay, Desai. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah professor Desai. Okay. Yeah. Right. He's in Ahmedabad. Yeah. Okay, sir. I think we'll uh, call it a day. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. That was a good week, session. We have another webinar on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ram, and thank, thank you, Desai. Thank you. Bye, bye, Dr. Kibriya. Thank you very much. Bye, bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank bye, bye. So. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Next week we have minimally invasive plating of fractures with soft tissue coverage. These are two talks next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alam, bye bye.